Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Today we have Dr. Molly Cummins. She's an associate professor of nursing and adjunct professor of biomedical informatics at the University of Utah. She's made numerous scholarly contributions in informatics and leads a program of research related of research related to the introduction, the induction of knowledge models for clinical decision support and informatic applications in poison control. And today she's going to be talking to us about peer review and research reproducibility. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak today. So when I was asked to speak on the topic of peer review and reproducibility, I recognized a good opportunity to learn something about it myself. So I'm not coming to this topic as an expert in this area. I'm coming to this topic as a learner. And uh, so I'm going to share with you what uh, I've been able to learn about peer review and reproducibility and invite you to uh, jump in and join the conversation as we go. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm going to map the terrain. I'm going to review some of the, the issues and initiatives around uh, peer review and reproducibility and how those have evolved over the years. Uh, some of the, the role of journals and peer reviewers in advancing reproducible science and uh, some of the persistent issues that require some thought and creativity going forward. Uh, so just a, a brief review, the peer review process. You know, the basic idea of peer review is that when we conduct a study, uh, we write about our findings. The journal editor, we submit it to a journal, and the journal editor sends it out to two or three people for peer review. And those peer reviewers read it, and they comment usually on its strengths and weaknesses, and um, um, maybe something more structured, maybe not. Um, and then the editor sends those comments back. We modify our reports accordingly, and a decision is made about publication. And the idea is that um, that peer review component, that those two or three people are the gatekeepers. They're um, ascertaining quality of these studies and making recommendations to the editor. And so we've depended upon that system for many years um, to ensure the quality of the manuscripts and the quality of the science that's reported in the literature. Um, but the system, well, we've, as we've learned, is very flawed. So the purpose of peer review is to ensure that quality, um, quality of the, the papers, quality of the science. Um, but it's only two to three reviewers, and those reviewers can have biases of their own. Um, they can be knowledgeable about some things and not about other things. Um, they may. Um, they may actually provide a bad review of a perfectly fine study or a study that's uh, viewed as perfectly acceptable for publication by another reviewer just because they have some biases about the science and um, the questions that are being asked and the findings. Um, they can, the, the reviewers vary in their expertise um, depending upon how much time they have. How many of you have done a review on an airplane in a hurry? <laughs> Right, sometimes you have the time to really provide a thoughtful, detailed review, and sometimes it's just what you can offer at that point in time. Many reviewers don't have appropriate statistical, statistical expertise for the papers they're reviewing. You know, editors, editorial boards, they're choosing you from a checklist in their editorial management system that has no, no uh, a nuanced description of your particular areas of expertise. I know we've all had manuscripts come across our desk where we really weren't familiar with the methods being used and couldn't fully adequately evaluate those. Uh, biased reviews we mentioned, and um, you know, some journals are smaller or emerging journals. They don't have a high volume of submissions. So even if the reviews are lackluster, an editor might decide to publish anyway, just because they need to put something in print. So this is a very flawed, very imperfect system um, for ensuring the quality of the scientific literature. And we know this. We know there's a, a wealth of evidence that uh, studies are poorly reported. There are problems in the reporting of statistics. Um, there are particular problems with uh, reporting of sample size estimation, randomization, blinding is a particular problem. There are some studies that showed that uh, blinding is only described in something like 14% of randomized controlled trial reports. Uh, data handling, 
misuse of basic statistics uh, there, are, and of course we have acknowledged in this series the severe pervasive and continued issues in scientific reproducibility. And this is not a new concern. So the oldest, the oldest article that I found was dated 1966 that found issues in the reporting of scientific studies. Uh, the article in JAMA by Shore and Carden. But it was really in the 1980s where that evidence base started to grow, um, that started to re increase our degree of concern about the whole process of peer review and whether it was really working for us. Uh, the 1980s saw more emerging evidence of reporting issues. I've uh, included here a couple citations that Melissa will appreciate. These are related to the quality of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Uh, the, the report by Mulrow, you mentioned uh, the chair of general internal medicine. So um, this Mulrow study actually looked at a sample of articles from the four, the four journals in general or internal medicine that had the very highest impact factors. So I know the Lancet was one of them. These are very high profile journals um, and found that absolutely uh, none of the review articles uh, in those journals fully met a set of quality criteria that he applied, none of them. Molly, did you come across the fraction of reviews that are able to deal with individual patient data as opposed to group data? You know, honestly, Alan, I didn't delve in at that level of detail, so I can't answer your question. But I can point you to some of the literature that I discovered along the way. That'd be great. Okay. <clears throat> So um, into, the, into the 90s, <laughs> uh, in the 90s we, we definitely saw increasing evidence of um, bias related to methodological flaws and this was especially around randomized controlled trials and preclinical research. This is when the literature really st seems to have um, developed in that area and um, a more widespread awareness of the flaws in reporting. And so this is when we saw the advent of reporting guidelines. And these are two, um, two of the big reporting guideline efforts that emerged during that era. The CONSORT guidelines, which are um, fairly well known, um, and then uh, QUORUM. QUORUM later uh, was renamed PRISMA, and those are the systematic review guidelines. And there are more examples of guidelines. In fact, let's just, uh, we're gonna take a little detour at this point and talk about guidelines, because guidelines are one of the most um, useful tools for authors and peer reviewers in terms of ensuring reporting. So CONSORT um, defines guidelines for reporting trials. And so it stands for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials, and it's an evidence-based minimum set of recommendations for reporting randomized trials. So basically this is, you've probably seen this used in articles, used in journals. It's a 25 item checklist plus a flow diagram, and they do have an explanatory document um, that helps you learn how to use those. Um, so this is the first page of the consort checklist, and this is uh, the very, a very common format for this type of guideline is a checklist like this. And as a peer reviewer, if you're looking at an article, you've selected a guideline appropriate to the article, or if you have a really good editor at the journal, the editor has, has already informed you which guideline is appropriate to apply as you review. You can actually note the page number um, where that criterion was met. And here's the concert flow diagram, which you'll probably recognize from any journal articles. And CONSORT has a number of extensions. Uh, a lot of these guidelines, there's a core guideline, and then there's an extension for specific types of studies. And Alan, this is where it might be interesting to delve in and see what guidelines would apply to the types of reviews you'd be looking at at that conference in Michigan. Um, some other important guidelines, the sample guidelines for reporting of uh, statistical results in the literature. Uh, there was some organizing work from the International Journal of Medical Editors that led to the sample guidelines authored by Lang and Altman. And uh, 
these are just incredibly useful tools to you. This is an incredibly useful tool for teaching PhD students, um, for working with teams and new authors. Whenever um, anyone who's going to be publishing a study for the first time, this is an incredibly useful guideline. And of course, for peer review. And then, um, because Melissa's here, I have to talk about Prisma. Uh, these are standards for reporting of systematic reviews. Very nice. Uh, again, they're set up very similarly to Consort. This is a very common format where there's a criterion and um, then a place for, as a peer reviewer, you can uh, note where that criterion was met in the literature. Pris uh, Prisma also has a number of extensions for specific types of systematic reviews and meta analyses. <coughs> and there are a number of other reporting guidelines. So I'd refer you to the Equator Network. They have a search engine. So if you're trying to find a guideline that's appropriate for a particular type of report, a particular type of manuscript and study, it's a great starting point. It has most of them there and links out to full copies and materials. Um, of interest for the type of research we see in the College of Nursing, we'll do more observational studies. Um, we do a lot of qualitative research, and there are guidelines for that. And um, for us also, uh, Consort has an extension for non-drug interventions that's very applicable to the type of research we do. And I'm sure you could find appropriate guidelines for the type of research um, you engage in. Would those Consort appended guidelines be applicable to things like extracorporeal support? I don't know. I don't know. And are, is this is this website you just had on the screen used by the major journals? Um, many of them, but that's that's developing. So if you consider that these guidelines emerged in the '90s, and um, well, let me go where I'm going next. We'll come back to that. Actually, that's an area for some good discussion. So what happens, so these guidelines emerge in the 90s, and they're still in use. They're still being updated. They're still being, um, journals um, took the approach where they endorsed and didn't enforce. So journals would sign on and say, we endorse the use of this guideline. Um, and they often would include them in, as instructions to authors and peer reviewers. And of course, they're available for optional use by any peer reviewer for any journal because most of these things are freely available. And we use them as teaching tools. Um, but what, what we've uh, realized in the, in the 2000s, you know, we had increasing numbers of studies indicating um, more evidence of problems in peer review, scientific publishing, and reproducibility despite those endorsements. So there was this recognition that um, endorsements aren't enough. In fact, this is a particularly interesting study by Mills and colleagues um, that found that uh, journals, um, journals are um, endorsing, not enforcing the consort statement. Um, it looked at prominent journals that were endorsing it, including it in their instructions, and then looking at what was actually published in those journals. And the quality was still poor, almost unchanged in quality. It's really... Uh, uh, quite discouraging. Yes. I think one thing that they have people have to be careful about is these are guidelines for reporting, and it doesn't mean that the people did the things in the methodology. So you don't know when you're looking at the mm -hmm. report if they just didn't report it or they didn't do it. Right. So it is. You know, mm -hmm. hopefully people are putting in a statement and the limitations or whatever if there was something they didn't do. But I, I'm an editor, and I find that a lot of times they're not. In some of uh -huh. those, it's um, an important distinction, and really the purpose yeah. of peer review is to ensure quality. The purpose of guidelines is to ensure yeah. adequate reporting so that uh, peer reviewers can discern quality. Yeah, it's right. different. You don't know if it's not in there, you know, and stuff. Right. And I think the other, I think the other problem is from, um, certainly from an editor's perspective, but I bet it's also from a peer reviewer's perspective, it takes incredible amounts of time to do these checklists. And I don't always have time because yes. the journal only pays me for so much time. And then I gotta do mm -hmm. my university work. I mean, so that's a problem across the board. Oh, I agree. So I absolutely agree. And it's getting worse. Yeah. Let's um shall we 
Shall we go back to the future? <laughs> okay, so we're in the 2000s, and we found out that journals endorsing these guidelines just isn't working. It's not working. Uh, and at the same time, um, I, I never know how to pronounce this. Someone help me. Ionides? Uh, Ionides. It's Ionides. I-O-N-I-D-I-S. Ionidas. So it's not spelled. I've, like uh, I've misspelled it. John I apologize. Ionides is a Greek American. Okay, so John Ionidas publishes this famous essay, right, that we all circulated to our PhD students and we all talked about. And there's all of a sudden, um, it's in the popular media, and we have all this criticism. <laughs> Um, so we're, you know, we are launched into this era of fake news and science <laughs> where, um, you know, we've gotten to the point where people are actually trying to reproduce studies and they're um, not able to do so. And this commands the attention of, of everyone, the NIH, leading journals, scientists everywhere are talking about this. Uh, the NIH and some uh, leading journals can actually convene a joint workshop and make recommendations on the reporting of preclinical research. We have the emergence of the top guidelines. Um, those were published in Science in 2015. And then NIH um, completely changed its, uh, its process for uh, vetting applications for funding to incorporate consideration of uh, rigor and reproducibility. So now we've entered this era of escalating concern so what we've learned at this point in time is rigor and reproducibility won't happen on its own. You, uh, we've, we've learned the hard way that you can't just put out more tools and more education and hope that people will opt to use them, both authors, peer reviewers. Um, the peer review process is flawed and that we're gonna continue to see tremendous variability in reporting without system level approaches. Um, so individual peer reviewers cannot bear the burden of, in, of ensuring rigor and re reproducibility. We have to create those systems and processes that support peer review. Uh, just like we create systems and processes that help um, prevent medical error in the hospitals. Uh, you don't just let everything happen and blame it on the nurse later. You know, you try to create robust systems that prevent error. In the same way, we need to create robust systems uh, for scientific publishing um, that help ensure rigor and reproducibility. So now in the current decade, what we're seeing is a transition to requirements and enforcement and the burden that goes with it. Um, so let's take a closer look at the top guidelines, which are starting to be enforced by leading journals. Um, so the top guidelines uh, are <coughs> sort of making a shift, um, uh, making a shift from basic quality of reporting into that reproducibility realm. So here we're seeing criteria around um, data transparency, code transparency. What are data citation? I don't understand. Um, so, so you're appropriately describing your data and documenting your source. There are different levels for how you would demonstrate this. Um, but data trans... Transparency is just making it open. Um, depending upon the level. <laughs> so each of these criteria has different levels where, um, you know, at a, there's sort of a basic level of, of, I guess for, you know, data transparency saying, um, you know, I'll let you look at my data if you email me and we, we share a non you sign a non-disclosure agreement, then I'll let you look at my data to all the way to posting your data somewhere in a repository for anybody to access. So the different levels, but these are sort of the dimensions um, against which you could dem demonstrate rigor and reproducibility. Research materials transparency, um, design and analysis transp transparency, uh, pre-registration of studies on OSF, uh, pre-registration of analysis plans on sites like OSF, and and then full replication. You know, actually going to the the step of having someone else replicate your study before you even publish. It's true, that's, Julio. That's not even always possible. No, it's not always possible. I mean, how you do a replication of a study in a supernova? <laughs> 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 right. 
Yes, and I think everyone would, would agree upon that. And the top guidelines have, um, they offer some flexibility in how journals adopt these, at which level they adopt it or adopt these and require them so that discipline specific mm -hmm. variation can be accommodated. So do they recommend for number eight that a clinical trial be duplicated before it's published? Uh, I, I don't, I think that's probably the, the penultimate demonstration of reproducibility. If you can have someone else independently reproduce your findings I think it's an absolute prior to idea. publication. What I'm interested in is if that's really their intent, if that's what they're putting on the table. Is it horrible? Mm. Well, and Why some is it of these, a horrible well, idea? Some of these huge clinical trials, like the one that I had tons of friends that were part of, this was probably 10, 11 years ago. It cost 13 million to do that original trial. Who's gonna then? Who's gonna pay for it? it? Well, and and more. And who's gonna publish it? But <laughs> well, what if the results are wrong? No, because I understand that, but somebody's got to pay for it. But also, also, you are not. I mean, a journal article does not represent true. It represents the findings of a research, uh, and I think that that's it. I mean, I'm all in favor of disclosure and, and better quality and stuff like that. But but if people think that you can construct scientific truth from one, si one scientific paper, you are confused. The scientific truth comes from the judgment of the crowd, the collection of all the knowledge. And I mm -hmm. will call people's attention to a very, very old book that the, is the, the letters in between Newton and Leipzig. These are the two people that discovered differential calculus. And these people couldn't understand, and they never understood within their lifetimes, that they were doing the same thing. <laughs> because they use different languages and stuff like that. So I think that that's something that is missing in these discussions that journals are ways for scientists to communicate with each other and not representative of the real truth. I mean, mm -hmm. with all the things get compiled into comprehensive reviews, you start going to the judgment, and then eventually looks at the books and eventually to clinical practice. But that's a long process, and you cannot expect that and the best scientific paper is real scientific truth. It's just the findings of that study. And if people don't understand that, they, 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 they have a big problem. But, uh, I think Julio articulated very well an important argument. But I, I'd like to make a counter argument. Uh, your argument implicitly uh, embraces the idea that this is a self-correcting system. That if we all publish our observations, eventually the truth will out and the junk will fall by the wayside and be ignored. No, I'm not talking but, about junk. I'm, I'm talking yeah. about contradictory findings because uh, well, the horse are different. The things that are wrong. Yeah. Can we let Molly okay. do the presentation and we can discuss after? I, I'm actually enjoying it. I think she, these are important okay, conversations. I invited the discussion at the <laughs> beginning. Yeah. So th this, uh, uh, Darwin understood that this was not the case, that we could have individual decision making <clears throat> that disadvantaged the species, even though it advantaged the individual baker or uh, carpenter or homemaker. So I, I, I think there is a real discussion here that could be fruitful for us about how much self-correcting we can expect. And I think the evidence indicates that we cannot expect a lot. So I think it's worth examining what I find most interesting, that item number eight that you just displayed, about whether or not people should assure that what they think is the result of their study is defensible. And that may require half as many studies and twice as much money, uh, but I think it will make us a better system. Anyway. But I, so it's. But, but I think, I mean, I think what you're getting at is the way I've always 
when the way I was trained was that you put out the results of a single study and you don't believe totally those results anyway unless it's been replicated in an independent laboratory. You know, and that's always been part of the way. Now, do we have problems with bias in publishing? Absolutely. You know, like how many null results are stuck somewhere in a drawer, right? And that's mm -hmm. a problem and yes. that kind of stuff. So, at, and at least in my field, this is probably true of all of medicine except maybe maybe some drug trials, I don't know, because I do rehab. Um, <clears throat> we have almost no dosing studies. No Most what? of no dosing studies. So if you do something with a different dose, different frequency, duration, schedule even, could have different results, but we have no idea the impact of those. We have, compared to drug studies where they do thousands and thousands, like our biggest randomized controlled trials have like 400 people because of the difficulties in rehab. So we have almost no studies who can look at um, very much the characteristics of the people that we're serving to see how who's actually responding and who isn't. So like in my field, it's no wonder we have some of these issues because we haven't been able to study those things that are probably critical, so we don't know. And I suspect that's true for a lot of medicine and health um, as well. And so, but those studies, I mean, the amounts of money already spent on, I mean, I don't know. And, and rehab trials are expensive because you've got to pay for the therapist at the therapist time. You know, so we have some of the most expensive trials. Um, but so, anyway. Mm -hmm. I think this really and I, I think you know, and this is this is the mill you were in, um, but we still have a responsibility to uh, um, to vet the scientific literature and ensure that there's some level of quality there, and that there's adequate information there that allows us to interpret it, and maybe in, interpret it in more nuanced ways, you know. Um, but we need to be able to fundamentally interpret it. Uh, and in terms of reproducibility, uh, journals have a lot of options these days. They can host supplemental materials online so that people, if, if they choose to do so, they could share data, code, protocols, all the information that would allow someone to, to truly understand what they did and interpret it in a much more nuanced way. Um, so these are, you know, those dimensions, those eight dimensions. These are the tiers that journals can choose uh, to land on for how that would be how that would be required for their journal um, disclosure uh, requirement or verification. And <laughs> so, so these top guidelines slide uh, slides I took directly from top this these three or four slides, um, and that's their notation encourages level zero. <laughs> so uh, again, away from the endorse and encourage. Uh, so at level one, for example, for data sharing, um, an article would state whether the data are available and if so, where to access them. For level two, it, the criteria would be data must be posted to a trusted repository and exceptions must be identified at the time of article submission, so if any data is withheld. And then level three at the highest level, the data would be posted to a trusted repository repository and reported analyses will be repro reproduced independently uh, prior to publication. So that top tier would be the tier I would think you would endorse, that you would support. Um, but the journals can choose, uh, choose a configuration of these dimensions and tiers that make sense for their audience, for their discipline, for the type of research that they publish. Um, so, for example, for science has chosen this approach. Do you know, in these public places for registration and all this stuff, are, if everybody were to jump on this bandwagon, are they prepared? And I'll give you an example. So, um, I was part of a consortium of rehab journals, and several years ago, it went into effect in 2016, January, that we required pre-registration of all clinical trials, NIH definition, not clinical trials.gov definition. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for anything where recruitment started after January, they had pre-register, and retrospective if recruitment had started before January. And clinical trials.gov was so completely overwhelmed that people were delayed for months on end because clinical trials wasn't prepared <laughs> for all of us going there. Did that I'm surprise sure you? <laughs> I mean, they seem to have caught up yeah. now, but yeah, it was it was a big problem, and it and it created a lot of problems.
because of the systems we work in that demand mm -hmm. that you show you must have had an accepted publication two or three or four or five per year and this was delaying things quite significantly. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good example of the fact that we don't have a system yeah. that's integrated and coordinated. And like Joseph when, Stalin had. Yeah, and that, he had an integrated <laughs> system. And then when you're dealing with way. international <laughs> authors, it becomes even more complex because some countries don't have some of these things. Mm. I don't know if, I think anybody can go and click the drop, drop. I'm yeah. not sure. But still, it was. Yes. it's an interesting thing when you're dealing with countries where the research, maybe knowledge and all of this kind of stuff isn't quite as evolved, but they're trying to, be, you know, so it, it mm. just complicates. Well, there are, I mean, there's, uh, in, in going beyond current clinical trials, you know, there's open science, frame, um, open science framework, OSF. Well, yeah, but you, uh, know there are, you are part of health science systems with HIPAA requirements. Lots of times, like, we, we were told we couldn't use those because it's not HIPAA compliant. I use OSF all the time. Really? I just store the data on box securely oh, and, nice. and document a hyperlink to it. And, you know, you can still use those tools um, to document your procedures and your uh, analytic code without disclosing any PHI in, in, um, or hosting any PHI in those places. So they're allowing it now because at one time they were disclosed. Well, well, so you can use it. You just can't put PHI there, you yeah, know. For a while they weren't trusting us to do anything with <laughs> systems that weren't PHI compliant to the health side. So, oh, okay. You know, so the, the repository is of interest to me because of an experience that we had when we did an important randomized clinical trial of extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal for patients with lung failure in the 1980s and 90s. We put all our information, all our data in a supplement in a data repository that was supported by the American Thoracic Society because we published in their leading journal. Uh, those data are not available. You can't find them. You can't find the website. You can't mm -hmm. find the repository. That's been a problem for, I don't know, 15 years, 18 years. Uh, I've tried to go back to the data. I can't find them. Mm -hmm. And the Thoracic Society can't find them. So one of the things that I'm wondering about is how well will these repositories be maintained? Well, Open Science Framework actually has systems in place if it should ever shut down. It has funding to last forever. So that was one of the first things that they did was to establish uh, the funding and processes to continue anything that would be put in it until uh, if it should shut down. Well, so, but did, about it from yeah, Good. yeah. <clears throat> And so this is the new frontier that we're in right now, these top guidelines and the adoption of these by journals and how that's playing out. And of course, I didn't throw this up here for you to actually read on the slide, but uh, this is you know, just a blurb about the adoption of, of, of the top guidelines and other measures by um, the Nature family of journals. Um, so Nature's been very progressive. They've been in sort of the organizing discussions and they're trying to implement this. One of the interesting things they mention in this blurb is uh, the burden. The burden issue came up earlier in the discussion. Uh, so when you start to require all of this documentation and you want people to put code somewhere and you want people to do this and that, and the editorial team has to enforce it and build systems and processes around it, it is incredibly cumbersome and time consuming. So submitting to a lightweight journal that doesn't have any of this is way easier than to submitting, submitting to a journal like Nature. Um, so we'll hold that thought. Um, and additionally, it doesn't, um, back to that nuance difference between the purpose of things like quality guidelines and checklists, which is to ensure the quality of reporting. It, it still doesn't do anything to necessarily ensure quality. It's just ensuring that the reporting is robust enough to discern quality. Um, so some, it doesn't um, get around that fact that there's still just two or three peer reviewers looking at an article. So people have done some thinking about this. Can we blow up that component of the peer review system? So in addition to top guidelines and reporting guidelines and requirements, moving from endorsement to requirement, can we blow up peer review in and of itself? And so some journals have, have adopted innovative approaches like interactive peer review processes. Um, so in this process, 
process. This is an, just an example from one journal, but there are multiple journals that are trying this. Um, so the editor gets the manuscript, and then they post it to a public forum for a discussion period. And during that time, uh, they've already identified who the reviewers will be. And uh, so both the identified reviewers and the general public are welcome to comment on the manuscript and the authors can respond in an interactive process. And only at that point is the manuscript either accepted or revised and then perhaps accepted to the journal and then the editor could decide to reject. So there's actually a um, pre-submission period of public comment and discussion. So it's, it isn't even published until that happens. Um, but when I, I got into some articles about this that I was able to find on PubMed, and one of them um, sort of took a look at what happened at one journal when they implemented this process. And while there were several articles that had some, act, some good activity during the commenting period, most didn't have any activity at all. So they set up this whole process, but the public wasn't engaged. It's interesting. Um, you see that theme pop up here, too. Uh, what about post-publication? Well, pre or post-publication, I guess, in these two cases. Um, this idea of having forums for public comment, engaging more than two or three peer reviewers, pulling in larger groups of people. And uh, there are different models for this. There's opening things up to the public for discussion and comment, or you could open it up to something like a working group. You know, just a broader pool of people to comment on a study before it's actually published. So ResearchGate, in ResearchGate, you post an article in ResearchGate and people can endorse it or comment on it. Uh, let's see here. Let me just show that to you. I have it pulled up. I still can't pronounce his name, but John I. <laughs> Ioannidis. Ioannidis. I'll practice, I promise. Uh, you know, this is a recent article that um, he published that is very relevant here. And uh, so our options here, you can um, comment on it. This is what, what no one's this commented. Is ResearchGate's website? ResearchGate. Mm -hmm. So you can search for an article or an author on ResearchGate. And if they've posted the article, uh, then you can add comments, or, and you can also have the option to recommend. Is that a good website? I, I it's had dump their emails. Um, so they, they keep telling me my articles are now <laughs> and I just throw them away. Is, is that? I won't make a qualitative assessment of it, but I, I participate at some level in ResearchGate, and I know that it's seen heavy adoption by the academic community. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Melissa, can you elaborate? Yeah, it is seeing adoption. I think people are still somewhat skeptical of it, but um, it's clearly being used a lot, and particularly, I think, for people in non-Westernized countries to access scientific information because a lot of people post their preprints there. Right. Um, and so that's one of the, the biggest activities is sharing uh, like drafts of manuscripts and things. And Before they've submitted for It, it could be. But that's sometimes know. problematic. Like the journal I edit, if, there's, if something's been posted yeah. pre-submission somewhere, we won't accept it. We won't even consider it because that's a considered a form of publication. Mm -hmm. And you so do you search for it? With all the authors. Um, it's well, it's just come up recently, but that is the rule that they're not like they can they can get permission to put something on pre-publication, but if it's pre-submission that it's been up somewhere in a public forum, then we do not allow them, and we won't. It's, I, I don't know what we're going to do because, frankly, I'm even having trouble keeping track of checking all the pieces and all the standards that we say we do, and I put into place after I started coming to that first workshop and found out a little bit more. Like, I'm making my people talk differently about their results, if, especially in these small studies. I'm making them um, calculate fragility indexes. Um, you know, some of the, I'm making them talk about were the results even above the SEM of the measures. You know, mm -hmm. and some of this kind of stuff. And I've got to remember to check all of that as well as, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do. It's a lot. It's just, these things are continually, coming mm -hmm. up as new stuff and they don't pay me for I think there's job. a fundamental issue with this anybody can comment proposition. Mm. 
I mean, Tell, say what, more about that. Yeah, that's does, important. <laughs> what does Julio care about my comments about some quantum analysis paper? I mean, you know, I'm not prepared. Uh, I might make some comments. There are plenty of people who would do that, you know, with good intent. Uh, I'm not talking about the malicious people. But, you know, I think crowdsourcing may be a good way to fund something. But I'm not sure crowdsourcing is a good way to get at the truth. I mean, uh, there are certain periods in civilization when crowdsourcing would have established as truth the fact that the planet was flat, and the fact <laughs> that the sun revolved around the Earth, and a whole bunch of other things. I thought that things. was true. <laughs> And and it's so. And how would how do you feel about uh, commenting on a manuscript, but then having that entombed for all time on the internet, retrievable by a search engine? I feel okay about it. You're okay about it. I think that still we need to distinguish. I think that when I ask to review something, I think that my assignment is to assess scientific relevance, no total scientific correctness. For instance, mm. if I publish, I, I, I do a very little four or five people study, and I find something extremely un, unusual. Uh, I mean, as far as I report that I did that with five people, I found this a totally unusual result. and. They clearly state that that may not be significant, statistically significant. I think that that is a, a study that has a lot of scientific relevance because can point towards new things. Mm -hmm. But I cannot claim that that, uh, that piece of work has scientific accuracy, which is a different issue. But in other hand, for the scientific community to report very unexpected findings and stuff like that may be very relevant for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. But I also then, it's up to you to speak about it correctly. That's so correct. I've been sending uh, um, lots of articles back saying, okay, you did a one group pre-post trial, you can't talk about effectiveness. That's correct. You know, and you gotta, be, and you gotta talk about how hesitantly, like, look, people got better. Um, it looks like, but you know, you got to be careful. It's correct preliminary in the stuff. description, yeah. but no yeah. correctness of the sign. Those are two very different yeah. issues. I think that with a, a sufficiently robust description, you can discern a bad study. You can discern a study that was so poorly designed that you cannot publish it. I mean, the you can't trust the results. You can't. Um, and it can't be helped by a good discussion section, you know. And, and I think, um, I, you know, and I hear what you're saying. I actually have, I struggle with pre-registration and criticisms of p-hacking because I've seen um, plenty of work where, um, it, well, they somebody doesn't find, uh, um, you know, they don't find the result they thought they would find in their study, but they found some other results where they have statistical significance and they report that instead. It wasn't the outset. And there are some, and there's validities to some criticism of that, but I also think that we can't discard all this data that we're collecting simply because it wasn't what, we didn't set out to analyze it in the way that ultimately made sense. And that we can learn from the scientific data that we collect. Um, it, you know, it, even if we collected it for a different purpose in the first place. I, I struggle with that whole argument uh, for pre-registration. Maybe it makes sense for cr drug trials, but, <laughs> you know. Um, well, I think part of the thing that the, the pre-registration does is it does get your protocol out there. I don't know, I mean, and I think for the big randomized control trials, talking about what was your analysis plan to answer the mm -hmm. primary research question makes sense and you're held to that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, everybody does some exploratory. But we do seem to have the structure in place for that now through the NIH yeah. at least. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so this is ResearchGate, and this this is m messy space. You know, how do you broaden peer review and engage the public? So, ResearchGate has chosen this approach where you can re recommend it. Recommending it is, you know, similar to hitting like on Facebook. You just click a button. Um, the interesting thing is, is that um, I looked around for a long time to find even one article on ResearchGate that had a comment. 
it's like silence. And I thought about that. And I mean, how many of you set aside an hour out of your day to, you know, troll articles on ResearchGate? Uh, you know. <laughs> I used to on PubMed Commons, but it uh, went dark March 5th. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you go look at some of the comments or, or, yeah. or, or, or to an article. Most journals will take that kind of material. Can you say that again? I'm not sure everybody heard you, Melanie. It went dark on March 5th because not enough people were commenting. And Ellen decided it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't forming as expected. That's well, well who, who has time? You, yeah, that's you, 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 you're yeah. listening from the back of the room. Nobody's got time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so time one, of the, one, of the, one of the major changes in healthcare since I engaged about 50 years ago is that it, it doesn't feel like a scholarly activity anymore. It doesn't feel like a university activity. Which doesn't? I'm sorry. Healthcare. Oh, healthcare. Healthcare, because I, I, I don't feel as if people have time to reflect and to think and to ponder and to plan. Every, I mean, particularly now, I mean, the academic physicians are like private practitioners. They're assigned a huge responsibility to bring in money for an institution that's a multi-billion dollar business. And I can tell you as chair, I'm an, an editor of the, it's the leading journal in our field, so we get a lot of subjects. I'm embarrassed in, by myself at how, how, in the seven years I've been here, I've almost not read any research articles, except when I have to write something a little bit, or I just had to write a chapter, you know, because I'm too busy doing all the bureaucracy stuff, the admin stuff that goes along with those two pieces of my job. And, and so, yeah, I have an account on ResearchGate, and I get those little emails and go, yeah, mm -hmm. isn't that nice? Too bad. Yeah. I mean, and much less reading in the regular journals in my area. Yeah, so it's crickets out there, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for the occasional, good job, interesting article. I mean, it's really not robust analysis of, of the work. And I find there's a lot of times we go through 12, 13 asks before I can find two reviewers. Mm -hmm. You know, much less people having time to go out and do some of the Who you can get. <laughs> oh, it's Who's willing to do it. Um, so then academia.edu is another approach. Uh, this is a, a, a site that thinks it has the solution to this space. And it's it creates um, an environment where you can invite a group. And so this might be a more targeted group. So you would invite let's say a working group from a, like an AMIA working group might be invited to, to do a pre-publication um, discussion on a manuscript. So the manuscript pre-publication would be posted to, um, oh, I can't remember what they call these spaces on academia.edu, a session. I think they call it a session. So they're invited to a session. It lasts for 20 days. And um, they have the article on the left-hand side of the screen. And you can attach comments to specific words or sections of text in the manuscript and have this commenting discussion period. And the idea being that that leads to revision and improvement of the manuscript prior to publication. So, um, so prior to publication or prior to submission? Prior to publication. So I thought you were talking about post-publication. Um, for academia.edu, they envision this as being pre-publication. I'm sorry if I misspoke. Um, so these articles would have been submitted to a journal, or, and then it's just pre because that seems like we catch a lot of that stuff before. So this is a company selling a product. Yeah. So they envision it as being part of that pre-publication. It doesn't mean journals have signed on or using it that so way. journals might use it. Mm -hmm. okay. But also, you could use it, it pre-submission. If you wanted to, they're they're sort of they're they're putting out the idea of a session for use in these ways. So, and that's different from ResearchGate, which would be post-publication. How do you define meta review? I I I they 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 do these meta reviews or conferences and stuff like that. That would be kind of similar. I don't know. Maybe you could use this for that purpose. I think it's it's more of a platform for doing the work than um, than a specification for how the work is done. It's just this 20-day session, they call it. Um, so these are some of the novel approaches that people are coming up with to sort of jump that 
limitation of peer review that, you know, editors desperately searching for two to three warm bodies to take a look at a paper. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, one could state pretty clearly from what you've presented that these are ideas and they may be interesting, but there are no data to indicate that they produce anything that better than the current system. That's true. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, I remember as a young investigator, the aphorism we were taught was, you're guaranteed peer review. You're not guaranteed fair review. You're not guaranteed correct review. You're guaranteed peer review. And it's the only thing the system provides. And not, but it's not obvious to me that we can get beyond that, but this is really interesting. It's, it's nice that people are thinking about it and trying, you know, trying on some creative solutions and seeing if they might work. It's one of the other big things. If we can, could figure out how to get authors to read the instructions, I probably send back at least a third of the papers because I haven't even read the guidelines to contributors. That it's things like, don't send me a 27 page paper when our limit is 22. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, put line numbers on. Don't send it with your name. I mean, much less the science. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they don't read these guidelines, even though we say you must follow the guidelines. You know? <laughs> So, so right now we're in an era of enforcement versus encouragement. So um, with enforcement of guidelines, registration, and reporting requirements, reporting reporting requirements apparently by reputable journals, uh, less reliance on individual peer reviewers to catch problems with quality and reproducibility, at least in reporting. Um, but an incredibly increased effort and time commitment to submit articles for publication. Um, so that's a big burden on authors. Increased effort and time for editing teams to process and check these manuscripts. So we've created just this, it's creating a monster in effect, um, this monstrous burden around publication. Now, I'm not making the argument that it's an unjustifiable burden. It's just, uh, it, you know, I do question whether it's sustainable and realistic. Um, it's so much easier to submit to smaller, more obscure journals that I wonder if we'll have a, an unintended consequence where authors, they just don't want to deal with all that. So they publish in less reputable journals that may not even endorse the guidelines that we all would agree are appropriate. So what else, what now? Um, we need to uh, get into that space of feasibility and sustainability. We, uh, how do we do this? <laughs> and, and, and in a way that the scientific community can keep it going and it's feasible. We, if this is the way things are going, we're definitely gonna have to reconsider our PT review criteria and other criteria for faculty productivity in light of the variation in journal practices. Submitting an article to a journal like Nature is just gonna be vastly different than submitting to some small obscure journal with, without a lot of requirements. Um, this whole space of crowdsourcing peer review before and after publication, um, you know, it's, it's, we don't know if this can work or not, but it's probably worthy of exploration and refinement to see if there's a model that might contribute um, to improving peer review. And so there I will just leave it with your further thoughts, questions, and concerns. That was a wonderful uh, way to stimulate discussion on an important topic. Thank you so much. I, I, I'd like to make a comment about the requirement. The, your last slide was endorsement to enforcement. Mm -hmm. Comment about enforcement. When do we have laws to enforce things? It's, uh, this is an insight I got from some recent reading. It appears to be when the culture doesn't produce the proper behavior. So if there were no murders, and if there were no uh, you know, automatic weapons uh, deaths in the United States, there would be no discussion about laws or about the Second Amendment or anything else. So I think a fundamental question here, actually linked to Julio's uh, implicit recommendation that this will be self-correcting, is how do we change the culture? I think enforcement is a bad strategy. 
uh, I mean, everybody's talked about the burden, the time consumption, we don't have time. It's because the culture has configured things in healthcare so that everybody has to work on things to assure that they have a salary. And that depends on publications. And it depends largely on the number of publications and also largely on grants, right? Doing the right thing is not an issue. I mean, nobody's gonna discuss doing the right thing if it doesn't fit with the imperative of getting publications and getting money. I think this right? is so I, I So my last comment yeah. is, I think the proper strategy is to focus on changing the culture. And I think that may happen because of the replicability crisis. It seems to me that the community at large Oh, I'm so sorry. Basically, if, if that's for me, would you tell them that I'm speaking? <laughs> the community at large may just put its foot down and say, what the hell is going on with the scientific community and with the healthcare community? With this estimation of 85% of the research dollars wasted, with this estimation by John Ioannidis and other publications that most of what's published is not right, with uh, Lara's book, I don't know if you're familiar with Lara's book about the time constant for a new truth in science, but he makes a very articulate discussion of the fact that what's accepted today is extremely likely to be unknown in a matter of a few years. Uh, so I, I, I'm wondering if the community won't say, this can't go on. And then, if, then maybe we will say, well, what we need to do is do the right thing, make sure that what we study and publish is in fact reputable and defensible, and uh, stop the current cultural imperatives. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that if we, if we enforce this, I mean, it's going to be an unbearable burden on a population that's already overloaded with information, overloaded with demands and work, and it just won't work. This is more than just a healthcare problem, it's science in general, and there uh, are there are several disciplines that are really uh, incredibly far ahead. Physics, I think, being the first and foremost of those. But I don't mean to put you on the spot, Eric, but I think your field has also done kind of a lot in terms of peer review as well that is a little bit different than I think that we've heard about from the healthcare opportunity. Would you mind commenting on that a little? Well, I'm not, so I'm not familiar with peer review in medicine. Right. So, but I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with conference or, or with you know journal review in general. Uh, I guess what I want to say, I there is um, there is more emphasis on uh, accompanying software and data, you know, submitting those things along with uh, uh, articles that are submitted. Uh, for publication and in some venues those things are submitted uh, after, right, after acceptance or in some cases they can be uh, submitted before. Um, when, you know, when they're, when they're done after that sort of as supplementary things and people are still trying to capture those things and still uh, assess uh, the extent to which they support uh, re uh, repeatability and uh, uh, also, since these things, since software is often reused by other people, you know the extent to which other people can reuse the software to continue um, uh, a line of inquiry. Um, it's becoming, I think, more uh, popular to perhaps have those things submitted along with the article, right? But the problem is what was said uh, just about what, five minutes ago, right, that this is incredibly burdensome for reviewers, right? I mean, not only do you have to review the, the article and make sure that the 
statistics are right and the argument is right and they've followed the protocol and those sorts of things. But now you have to look at the artifact as well, right? So that's an and and perhaps the person who is uh, uh, reviewing the article is not the same person that you really want, you know, reviewing the software, right? Um, in the computer science community, and some some of these things, essentially, sort of the the, the faculty tend to review the articles and the graduate students tend to review like the software on the theory that graduate students uh, have more time and more more knowledge about actually doing things. Right? So, um, and and this is, so this is becoming more more popular in computer science and, and computer science benefits from the fact that a lot of our, our artifacts are soft and easily copied and and you know sort of that, that whole artificial science thing, right? So I think there's a couple of things. Um, there's also this issue that's been cropping up, particularly in the for-profit journals of reviewers saying, we should be paid for all this work that we're doing. Now, my journal is always operating in the red, so there's, and we're a national organization owned, so it's not profit, but um, because some, I mean, people are being asked tons, so there's that issue that's coming up. Um, I think if we went to a system in which we really only published, well, for, I guess the issue is, I think we're using our publications differently today in the era, I'm gonna pick on health again, but in the area of evidence-based practice, differently than perhaps they were used in the earlier time periods because um, we're using it a lot to totally inform the right answer for health decisions, right? As opposed to a venue, and you brought this up, a venue for scientific dialogue, which is critical to have early kinds of, I mean, all your results, it's not science if it's not shared and talked about and all that stuff, right? But yet we're taking what we have as, oh, we got to base treatment decisions on X, which is, I think, part of the problem also. Um, and so if we went to a system where you really only published things when you had enough rep rep reproduced date, you know, um, findings, then we'd have to have some other way for easy conversation among scientists to like, somebody else says yes, but, and so we're gonna now do the next study in a little bit different way, or even if it's a pure replication or whatever. So, and I don't, maybe with the web, we're gonna have more of that, but right now about the only way we've been doing that is through conferences, which not everybody can go to, especially as they get more and more and more and more expensive, um, and so on. So that's, yeah, I think those are pieces. I, I, think, I think currently, I think that, that's extremely important. I think that what worries me about this is, is that to go to this very structured <coughs> uh, reporting and stuff like that for every scene. And I think that not a perfect way. I don't think that, what I say, like, Initial observations are the same that a clinical trial that cost you fifty million dollars, or, or the, the ultra extreme is the uh, hadron collider, in which this is a gigantic project in which it was deemed necessary to have two different detectors. But, but you, you, you know, there, there is a gradation of of, of requirements that are, I'm worried that that again, I mean, this critical sort of conversation that journal facilitate uh, will be affected by, by over-prescribing. And, and, and people, to me, I mean, what is in the journal is what is in the journal. I, I think that if, if anybody will do medical decisions with one publication, oh gosh, I don't want to see that. Yeah. I really like the tiered approach and the top guidelines, which seem to account for the fact that there is some variation in the types of things that are reported in the scientific literature, and there needs to be some accommodations made so that we can accomplish scientific communication. There, there is also a fundamental difference between what Eric mentioned in computer science and what Julio uh, refers to in physics and healthcare. Uh, almost all healthcare methods that I'm aware of uh, require uh, bedside judgment by some practitioner. Well, the bedside judgment now becomes part of the method. Doesn't matter what you write in the paper itself. You can write all kinds of guidelines in the paper for the method, but if the method includes what's going on in Melissa's head at the bedside, how does Julio ever know 
what the method is because he can't see inside her head. In fact, she can't even articulate very clearly what goes in inside her head according to psychology studies. So, so uh, to respond to Julio's concern about too rigid an approach, I'm thinking now about something we haven't discussed yet, which is uh, this theoretical learning healthcare system that everybody touts, nobody has, and everybody thinks is the vision of the future. Uh, the idea here is, reflects everything that's been said. It's too expensive to do clinical trials. The clinical trials are too limited. They don't deal with a large fraction of the patients. Therefore, we've got to learn from the healthcare system. Well, how do you learn from a healthcare system? Even if you're an informaticist like you and Julio and know how to deal with databases with millions of data elements, when the database contains unbelievable amounts of noise, it contains human error. It doesn't contain the reasons for which clinicians made decisions to do something, and only that that something has led to something in the database. And not even in terms of therapies does it have descriptions of what was actually done because and people write in the medical record ex for billing. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so the idea of having detail, uh, in my mind, is also pertinent for our movement towards a learning healthcare system where we might mm -hmm. actually learn, but we've got to address the quality of the data in the EMR. And both the university's yes. EMR and the mountain's EMR is full of absolute junk, right? I mean, I can tell you my blood pressure when I go to the doctor is measured improperly every single time. And if I didn't tell the physician assistant who measures my blood pressure and gets a wrong value that she has to come back in 10 minutes after I've had a chance to sit and, and all that stuff, it would be in the record. And I can tell you one example where I've, my normal blood pressure is about 112 or 14 over 56 or 58. <laughs> there, was, there was one measurement when she had me walk across a stone floor barefoot in the winter where I had a blood pressure of 160 over, I don't know, uh, over, you know, 96 or something or 80 or I don't remember what it was. But I said, that's not my blood pressure. Don't put it in the record. Now, what can happen if it goes in the record? Among the things that can happen <laughs> is an insurance adjuster may look at the record and decline to insure me because I've got hypertension when I don't have hypertension. Well, we got to do some really serious things about the record if we're going to move towards a learning healthcare system. And I think it's going to require, require what you don't want done, which is, you know, a, a robust, uh, perhaps even automated. I'm, I'm not talking about clinical care. I'm talking about journal. Yeah, so I had to ask. But, but they, they're story. starting to interact because we're doing this. But we and we run in, in, the, in the, even in the journal article, a lot of our interventions are multifactorial. Um, they're client centered, so there's no cookbook approach, right? You have to you make decisions based on principles, and how, there's no space in my page limitations for that, right? So what we've decided to do is, if we find one where it's not clear enough to describe that you think it's reasonable someone could, we're going to try to make people put an online supplement, and, and I think most of them will. But here was the other piece that I've forgotten that I was going to say last time. It also runs up against this push in probably the last 15 years or so for universities to make money off of manuals, that, of intervention programs that people have come up with, so they don't want to publish them because they're publishing a manual that they'll then get money for, but nobody can replicate it without the manual because it's not, it can't be described enough. Yeah, that's because we're, and, uh, and we're no business, therapist would ever be able anymore. to do it without going to a course. There, there's so much, there's so much we still need, you know, I, my, one of my favorite teachers, I went to Catholic high school. My high school physics teacher was named Father Pizers, and he was amazing. He guy was seven feet tall, and uh, 
everyone behaved within the, you know, within a hundred foot radius of his classroom because you routinely walk through the hall and he'd have some kid up against the lockers with his feet dangling. <laughs> but one of the things that Father Pizers did in our class was he passed out our graded exams in order, top score to bottom score. And he shed some daylight on how everybody was doing in the class. And you better believe everybody made it a priority to study for those exams. Um, it was a, a, you know, a point to avoid embarrassment and then also to compete and see who could get the top score. Um, shedding some light on, on the details of how we do our science is, I think, is an incredibly healthy thing to do. Um, and uh, surely we can, we can move forward into the next decade and work on issues of feasibility and sustainability and find a way to make sure that our scientific literature is more robust. Well said, and I'm, I'm glad you're in charge of solving the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Thank you.